Okay, we are live. Um, I think we can start now. Hi, everyone. I am super, super excited to be hosting and moderating this session. Thank you for everyone who's making it, because I know around the different time zones, it's a little bit difficult. I'm very grateful that Behruz John and Omi John have been able to make it today. I will do a quick introductions and we will get to it because we only have a little bit of time. I'm Afsana Rigo. I work with Article 19 and I'm a fellow at the Berkman Klein Center at Harvard University. Um, and today I am specially honored to be hosting one of my personal heroes and someone I've admired for a very long time and a wonderful collaborator of his who I was very lucky to meet not very long ago um, today in this session. Um, I'm grateful for both of you to be here. So I'll give some quick introductions. Um, Behruz Bouchani, who we have present with us today, is a writer, poet, journalist, filmmaker, and a human rights defender, and also currently an associate professor at the University of New South Wales. He left Iran due to his work as a Kurdish journalist and writer and activist. Um, after many of his collaborators were arrested and attempted to seek asylum abroad. Whilst traveling to find asylum in 2013, he was imprisoned in Australia's notorious offshore immigration detention in Papua New Guinea for six years. There, against all odds, he became an essential witness to Australia's hardline refugee policy and bypassed all barriers to ensure the plight of refugees on the island became public and we will talk more about this. Wuchani is the co-director of a documentary called Chukra, Please Tell Us the Time, which he filmed on the islands to show the um, issues and the current conditions of the refugees on the island and has published numerous articles in, in leading media outlets internationally. His memoir, No Friend by the Mountains, writings from Manus Prison, won the Victorian Prize for Literature and the Victoria Pre Premier Prize for Nonfiction in January 2019. All of this while still incarcerated on the islands. The book itself, and we will talk about this a little bit more, was in itself a miracle that it happened. It was typed out on mobile phones and series of text messages and PDFs over time and translated from Persian by um, collaborators such as Omi Tofirian, who we are very lucky to also have with us tonight. Omi Tofirian is an Iranian Australian philosopher and an honorary research associate at the University of Sydney. He is a lecturer, researcher, and a community advocate combining philosophy with interest in rhetoric, religion, popular culture, transnationalism, displacement, and discrimination. He has written extensively about philosophy, displacement, and has advocated for refugee rights throughout Australia. As I mentioned, he's also a longtime collaborator of Behruz Bhutani and worked on the translation of the book, No Friend by the Mountains. Can I welcome both of you. Um, Thank you for being here. And also, I just wanted to say today is a joyous day too, because um, as of last week, Behruz was granted refugee um, status in New Zealand and is uh, live videoing from there to us. Hi, both. Behruz, John, how are you doing? Hello, thank you very much uh, uh, for having me. Uh, it is a great honor. Status in New Zealand and is. Uh... Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah, so I'm in New Zealand right now. So I think last week uh, was the last chapter of this journey. So it's finished. But I think still I have some difficulty times. Uh, we will have an election in New Zealand in 50 days, and unfortunately, the opposition party politicized my case. So now there is a political debate about uh, my journey to New Zealand. So we will see. But my story finished. And, but unfortunately, people always, uh, I mean, the media, 
reduce uh, my work to only writing a book and in or they reduce my works to a, like a personal story yeah my story is not a personal story and uh, i always uh, have been writing or fighting to challenge this system the whole system so it is not a personal story so but unfortunately the media they always reduce uh, things i'm so sorry to hear that but we're so grateful to have you to talk about these things and also to continue advocating um Orinjan, how are you doing? Just checking in on you as well. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction. Um, oh, thank you, of course, for the invitation to be here. Um, I'm also really happy that um, Behruz now uh, has an opportunity to plan his future. And I think uh, what he said was really beautiful about the fact that um, his story has come to an end. But, um, but also, I think it was important that he... Uh, indicated that this is not a personal story. This is a story about a whole system that's affecting people all over the world. And as we speak, there are still people uh, in Papua New Guinea, in Nauru and in Christmas Island and in detention centers uh, on the Australian mainland who are suffering from that system. So this is a good opportunity to raise more awareness and hopefully to initiate action. Wonderful, thank you both. So I'll just get to some of the questions we have here and hopefully we can discuss more of this too. Just for some background, um, Behrouz, you left Iran due to your activism and journalism. How did your journey take you to Manas? And, I, and in that, I think you can also encapsulate how the journey of many people took them to Manas. Yeah, I think, you know, I have answered this question one million times over the past six years. Uh, yeah, it is a, you know, I, the, in Iran, I was working mostly as a cultural activist. So I can say that I am, so I'm Kurdish, but in, I am I'm like a minority in uh, Kurdistan because in my place, in uh, the place that I was born in, Ilan province, Ilan province is uh, uh, one of the four Kurdish uh, provinces in Iran. But uh, Ilan um, is like, uh, you, know, you know, we didn't have a big role in the history of uh, political and cultural movement in Kurdistan. Uh, and that's why I think it's very interesting in some ways that someone from, uh, you know, the, the Elam province uh, talk about uh, the political movement of Kurdistan. So we were like minority in Elam too, because most of people assimilated to the uh, Farsi culture. And that's why we were very active, I and some of my friends and colleagues to actually promote Kurdish culture there and uh, prevent this uh, kind of assimilation. And so we were very active in uh, that province for almost a decade. And finally, yeah, uh, the Iranian, uh, intelligent service or SEPA, SEPA Pastaram. So they uh, attack our office and they arrested some of my colleagues. So that ended up in my uh, journey. So I had to leave Iran. So I went to Indonesia. I was there for two or three months. Then I went to Australia by boat but uh, our boat was uh, sank. And that's why they arrested us. They took us off water. They put me in the jail in Indonesia. Then I escaped and I went back to Australia again after two weeks. And when I arrived in Australia, they, uh, I don't want to create drama around my story. That, that is one of my biggest problem with the mainstream media. They always try to create drama 
around my story. But really, when I arrived in Australia, it was my birthday on 23 July. And they, uh, yeah, they exiled me to Manus Island. So I was there for six years and finally, uh, I ended up in, in New Zealand. And on my birthday, on 23 July, just uh, three days ago, five days, I don't know, a week ago, I was uh, accepted as a refugee. So it's finished. So I was arrested on my birthday and I was, I was uh, believed on my birthday, yeah, which is interesting. So it is my whole story, but I'm really tired of this story. <laughs> Because I have to say that uh, a lot, and uh, people always ask me this question. And it's really difficult that you talk about the uh, part of your uh, particular part of your life many times. So, but now it's finished. So now I'm in New Zealand. Uh, and, you know, I explained that, I described it in my book. No front but the mountains and in other works too. Thank you. Um that's that's a that's always been an interesting story to always hear and it encapsulates the journey of so many people, especially from Iran, that try and leave um repressive regimes or their own situations to try and gain refuge elsewhere and end up being imprisoned anew. Um, I just in terms of the kind of full infrastructure of the Australian immigration policy and how Manus was created and those offshore prisons were created and what happened, I wanted to jump to you, Omid Jan. Can you give a bit of an outline of how this has been um, implemented and what's happening right now? Sure, that's a really important question, and I think um, a lot of these issues will become clearer. A lot of um, uh, the, the problems, the, the um, different forms of oppression that refugees have been facing in Australia will become clearer once um, we take a, a historical approach. But I think there are two different approaches historically to take to this issue. The first one is to look at um, the detention industry and border politics in Australia. Um, as it has taken shape over the last few decades. And the other one is to think about border politics in Australia uh, and immigration in general uh, by taking a longer view that um, uh, contextualizes it in the, within the history of colonization. So the, the, first, the first approach is, um, I think it's important to, to point out that uh, mandatory indefinite detention in Australia began in the early 80s. And that was actually with the Labor Party. The Labor Party brought that, um, uh, brought in that policy, uh, not the Conservatives, but, um, but it's been um, taken over by the Conservatives. And then as um, power um, shifted back and forth, um, the, the policies became um, even more brutal, uh, even more draconian. And, and I think it was it was in the early 90s. Sorry, it was uh, early 2000s, 2001, that uh, Manus Island and Nauru, two former colonies of Australia, were set up as offshore uh, detention centres. They call them processing centres, but in fact, uh, this has been one of the things that Betrus's challenges in his work. Uh, for people who have been locked up there, uh, these are not processing centres. No one is being processed there. There's no system in place. Uh, in fact, people are there to be punished, um, and they're, they're, these places are used, these sites are used as a form of deterrence to make si the situation so horrible that people um, uh, either uh, uh, agree to go back to their um, their countries, or they're forced to go back to the countries they fled, or they um, they perish, uh, which has been the case, um, for, unfortunately, for uh, quite a large number of people. Um, and this is in addition, the, the offshore centres, uh, um, detention centres are in addition to the detention centres in the mainland of Australia and also on Christmas Island, which is part of Australian territory, but is, is an island off the coast, um, uh, near, close to Indonesia. Now, this, is, this has been the situation since the early 80s, as I mentioned, mandatory indefinite detention. For, and, and that only applies to people who have come to Australia by boat. 
um, coming by aeroplane to Australia, seeking asylum once arriving by plane in Australia, the treatment is uh, completely different. So there's a particular kind of political project around people who uh, come to seek asylum by boat. And, and, um, and, and so again, to, to emphasize the, the, the uh, policy or the, the project that um, is designed to deter people from seeking asylum in Australia, that's, that's been the main goal. And also it's been uh, um, central to uh, election campaigns in Australia. In so many ways, election campaigns kind of revolve around um, uh, issues around the border, uh, issues around um, people seeking asylum, particularly by boat. But the, the, second, the second point very quickly is to think about what's happening in Australia in terms of border politics uh, in the context of the history of colonialism. And if we go back um, before, before the 80s, it was only in the 70s that Australia's white Australia policy was officially abolished. Um, so, you know, the, this, um, this locking up of people seeking asylum came very soon after Australia had a, a, a very racist uh, immigration policy. So we can see some continuities there already. But going back further, it was in the, the 60s that Australia... Um, started locking up um, West Papuan refugees who uh, crossed the border into uh, what you know now is Papua New Guinea and exiled them to, to Manus Island. Um, going further back, Australia also um, uh, detained um, people without charge during the First and Second World War, uh, people who had um, associated with um, fascism. Um, but of course, some of these, th these people had very uh, no links to, um, uh, to political organizations or political movements abroad. And some of them were even born in Australia. We could keep going back even further, but I think it's central here to, to identify the fact that Australia was set up by the British Empire um, over 200 years ago as a penal colony. And this project, this, um, um, this colonial project uh, to, to set up prisons and to multiply and replicate prisons has become part of its identity. And we can see that now with what's happening. And uh, if uh, something isn't done to stop this, something isn't done to challenge uh, and uh, dismantle this, um, this system, we can see that happening over and over again, and in, in particular within Australian society as well, uh, to its own citizens. Wonderful. Thank you so much for giving that outline. Behrouz, you spoke to me about this concept of it being this colonial project that it definitely is. And you uh, it reminded me that you definitely wanted to talk about the impact on the islanders in PNG that these detention centers have had. Um, do you want to tell us a bit more about that, the impact on their lives that you also witnessed and everybody else witnessed? Yeah, I think uh, the forgotten part of this uh, exile policy is indigenous people in Manus Island and in Papua New Guinea, in Nauru, and the whole region, I mean the whole Pacific uh, islands, countries. So I think it is the most forgotten part of this exile policy because uh, on based of my experience as a person who was working in Manus Island, uh, the humanitarian organizations uh, always uh, were talking about the refugees. And of course it was right. They had to talk about the refugees who were stuck there. And also uh, the, the media, the media only focus on the refugees and no one talk about the local people and indigenous people there and how this policy uh, negatively impact on uh, those islands. And for me as a person with, uh, you know, uh, with um, indigenous background, as a court, I think it was very clear that uh, we are facing uh, like a, a narrative which is wrong, you know? So these people were forgotten. So in Manus Island, the population is uh, 43,000 people in the island. 
So, and really on that time, uh, probably the only person who, who was sometimes try to raise that issue was me and Omid and just really some few people. Uh, and always our voice was, you know, wasn't here by the media, but I tried really to raise this issue and uh, write about it. And sometimes write some particular article about this. But uh, generally, you know, if we look at this policy, they spend uh, $9 billion on this policy, I mean, border protection policy in Australia. So they spend some part of it on the ocean, some parts in the detention in Australia, and some in Manus and mostly they put it in their pockets. I mean, the companies. So in Manus Island, there were some companies who were working there like uh, G4S. They were working for six months. After that, uh, Transfield. And they, then they changed their names to Broad Spectrum and IHMS. And Paladin, you know, these companies who were working there and their contract they was, you know, hundreds million dollars. They earned, they made the hundred million dollars in that island. But uh, the local people were forgotten, you know. For example, uh, the hospital there, so the local people were dying very easily in a very simple way because there was not uh, proper medical treatment for them. And beside that uh, the hospital, they were making a huge amount of money and they could spend only uh, $1 million to fix that hospital, but they didn't do that. So that was uh, really unacceptable. And in other side, uh, this policy, uh, you know, so from this 43,000 population, at least 2,000 people were working in the camp directly. So as a chef, as a, like a case manager or security guard, and at least 20,000 people were uh, relied on uh, this, uh, on the security companies, 20,000 people indirectly. So they actually, what's happened in Manus Island? So when they exiled us to Manus Island, the economy in that, con that island was on based of uh, agriculture, uh, traditional agriculture, and on hunting, mostly. And they had their uh, traditional economy. So what's happened, for six years, everyone were involved in these companies, and they, so actually they changed the uh, lifestyle in that island. And after six years, suddenly they closed Manus prison camp and that uh, economy collapsed. And everyone became jobless and they didn't replace it to a new uh, economy. So it was not a stable economy. And that's why if we now we look at that island, uh, sorry that I talk a lot, I, I finish it now. That uh, in that island now, people became jobless. Domestic violence, which is a serious problem in Papua New Guinea, it's very serious problem, now is increasing. Uh, there is a like a culture of like people, uh, yeah, you know, alcoholism or drinking uh, alcohol is getting worse and also using drug 
and in other side, 40 children remain. So these 40 children remain, they are, they, where are their fathers? Their fathers are refugees who were transferred to America. Some of them were transferred to Australia and now they are in detention. And some of them remain in Port Mosby, the capital city. And what's happened, there is not a law or any process to that these people take their children with themselves and their wives. So that created so much problem in that island because of the culture there. That the culture there, people, uh, the identity is on base of land. And these children, they know they won't have uh, any land in that island and they will have so much problem. And right now that created really, and in other side, uh, this policy damaged the environment very, very seriously. They damaged the environment. Uh, just imagine for six years, we didn't have, uh, so we always in that prison camp, we had to, they had to use plastic, you know, so we didn't have a metal spoon or plate. Everything was uh, plastic. And each person, each uh, person uh, produce like one kilo plastic at least per day. So we were 1,000 people and at least 2,000 people were working there. So 3,000 people per meal, you know? So what is that, that plastic? You know, I know that they had, they had the contract with the company there to put the uh, plastic I think in a place close to the ocean. So that really, really that damaged the island. And also they cut uh, the jungle to build the uh, new prisons. And later, uh, after six years, I saw that really they changed, uh, they cut uh, trees a lot because they are going to, I mean, the American Navy is planning to go to that island. So I mean, in the history of that island or in the history of Pacific uh, countries, Australia and superpowers they always look at those countries like, like a backyard. You know, they look at Manu Island as a place that they put their rubbish there. You know, they produce violence there. They export violence there, you know? So it is, uh, I think uh, it's very important that now we look at this policy in different aspects, not mm -hmm. only about refugees, this policy doesn't uh, impact on refugees only, that impact on local people, that impact on the region, and impact negatively on Australia, mm -hmm. damage the uh, democracy and the principles in that country. But unfortunately, uh, people or the you know academics or experts you know in and the media they really they are not aware of it you know. So just the last sentence. Sorry, I know I talk a lot. The last sentence is now I am in Christchurch city in New Zealand. This city is that city that last year we had the mosque shooting here and 57 people were killed by an Australian 
citizen, a right-wing person, terrorist. And I believe what's happened in Christchurch has roots in Manus Island, in Nauru Island, has roots in what the Australian government has done in those islands, because they did that on the basis of a long term of hate speech. And that hate speech, when you do that, it will, you cannot control it. And someone came here and did that terrible, horrible thing. Yeah. Thank you, Behrou. That was really illuminating and so important to be talking about. And I'm mm -hmm. hoping that you're going to be writing more about this um, now that you're in New Zealand and you'll be writing more. One thing I want to really get back to is also the use of these private security firms on the islands. And as we're in a tech conference and um, a lot of the audience here will be coming from different tech companies or tech adjacent work. Um, and we've seen especially in the US, some of these companies that may be even present at RightsCon, I know some of them are present where we have the Microsofts, we have Amazon, we have Dell and so on, who have been implicated in contracting business from um, these security companies such as G4S, Circle and so on. Uh, and they are also companies that really want to um, present themselves and a lot of their work as being for the people and for the betterment of humanity. Um, there's been a lot of different work from um, company employees uh, when it came out that there were different contracts with ICE in the US, for example, and the immigration enforcement in the US. Um, but we are pretty sure that some similar um, contracts between tech companies, whether it's cloud services and so on, are happening with these tech companies. And what I want to ask you to maybe have a short message about is to folks that could potentially either bring up these issues within their own companies or within this community that is a powerful tech community to hold companies that potentially make millions from these private um, enforcement uh, companies to um, kind of raise their voices and what would you want them to really bring up and how do you want them to hold their contracts with private immigration enforcement companies to account? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, uh, just a quick uh, thing I should mention is that, you know, we have a long uh, history or, you know, for a, such a long time, the civil society in Australia, a part of civil society, they have been protesting, they have been criticizing uh, this uh, government to release the refugees. But still, this policy exists. And still, this industry, I mean, refugee industry exists. So why? I think the main reason is that we should have this question, who is behind this policy? I think the heart of this uh, policy is the, are the companies. And if we don't criticize them, if we don't put pressure on them, nothing change. So instead of only criticizing the government, we should criticize these companies too, because no one talk about them. You know, a company such as IHMS, International Health uh, Medical Service. So they, I think they are the most, uh, the most, uh, you know, brutal part of this system. And they hide themselves because uh, behind the uh, morality, because they say that we are providing uh, medical uh, treatment for the refugees. But in fact, they are worse than uh, G4S. Because G4S, we know G4S. G4S is a company or Serco or other companies. They say that we are security company. But IHMS is a company that we 
they claim something else, but they are very, I think the main part of this systematic torture. I have said that, and I will say that, you know, so what we will should do on them, I think, uh, I don't know how to put pressure on them, but I think they are the heart of this policy and we should put pressure on them and we should cancel the, put the pressure on some, uh, the companies who are doing advertising for them or who are supporting them uh, to cancel the contract. And we did that once in Australia. Uh, and the interesting thing is that some of these companies, they have contract with the universities, you know, the universities. So in fact, the universities are, they are keeping people in those islands on, with the money that is provided by the universities and the universities invite someone like me to go there and talk about this, you know? I don't want to mention a particular name here, but in Australia that happened. For example, NGV, and sometimes these universities or the galleries, they are not aware of this. We should help them. We should provide information for them that they understand it. For example, NGV, which is a gallery, National Gallery of Victoria, for example, you know, they had contract with one of the, these companies and the art community uh, had a protest. And it's very interesting. I was in that gallery and I was talking about, uh, you know, artworks about this plight. So, I mean, it's very paradoxical and we should be aware that sometimes even those people who are really uh, care about these issues and they are a part of this system and they are not aware of that. Even, yeah, I want to talk about myself. That even I myself sometimes, I see that, you know, look, uh, how this system try to take control of someone like me or Omid or people who are working. You know, I mean that we are facing a very complex system yeah. and we should be really careful. Uh, but I don't know how to do that, but I think they are, the companies are the heart of this policy and we yeah. should criticize them. Yeah, especially IHMS. IHMS is the most uh, brutal part of this system. Thank you, thank you for that. And I think part of this call, especially for the conference we're talking at and the community we're talking to is that people that um, protested and striked against the implication of the company that they're working at within these sort of um, private companies and enforcement agencies should also hopefully look into whether their companies are also implicated in things that are happening all over the world, including in Manos and in Australia, and continue to put pressure on it. It's a difficult and complex system as you are explaining, but there are certain things and certain ways we can hold some of these companies who become implicated accountable. And I think that's really fundamental. And I'm quite um, happy to see that there's more research being done into some of the private contracts happening with some of these companies um, on these islands. And um, the thing I really want to get to as well, and I know a lot of um, folks in this community want to talk about, is we all know the, the way you and your collaborators had to bypass um, surveillance and information controls on the island. Um, Omid, could you give a little bit of an outline on how they try to block information from coming out from the islands and the different methods they use. And also a little bit about 
the ways you and other folks that were there managed to get this information out and frankly make the government look um, terrible in its actions and hold them accountable bit by bit. Yeah, um, really important um, point, um, but also really difficult to uh, to cover, to explain comprehensively. I'll do my best uh, and I'll also add something about some of the maybe philosophical implications of um, uh, doing this kind of work and um, designing these kinds of strategies. So essentially, uh, um, Behrouz created a whole network of people around him uh, initially through, um, through smuggled phones. Um, he had very limited internet access in the in the prison in the beginning, so he he tried his best uh, using those methods. But then he he um, smuggled in a, a mobile phone um, into the prison. There was an underground economy there, especially uh, with the um, with the local people working in the in the detention center um, providing help. And and Ben was managed to get a phone, and he contacted a whole range of people and created a whole network, uh, a support base around him. And he, uh, through that, he was introduced to his first translator, Munis Mansubi, who translated uh, for him and his articles uh, began to be published and he started to um, interact with a lot of journalists. And one of those articles uh, that was published in The Guardian, and I think it was his first article under his real name, uh, that in the first article in The Guardian, I read that and, um, and I contacted him through Facebook. Uh, and with horrible internet access and with um, a situation where he couldn't answer all of his messages, uh, luckily my message got through and he responded and we soon moved to WhatsApp. And basically, uh, like he had been doing with Munis, he started sending me messages, um, sending me articles to translate through WhatsApp. Uh, and he he made a, a movie through WhatsApp, and that movie was co-directed with someone, an uh, Iranian Dutch filmmaker living in the Netherlands. Um, so a whole range of really amazing things happened as a result of a, a smuggled phone and a, a weak connection, and a lot of perseverance and creativity. So uh, Behrouz basically um, wrote his whole book. Uh, on WhatsApp, and the, the messages were sent to Munis, who uh, compiled them um, with Behrouz's instructions into PDF files. They were sent to me. Uh, I was translating, and Behrouz was at the same time sending even more messages to add into uh, the PDFs that I had. So, like I said, it's very confusing, very complex, but all of this was taking place, and he was getting more and more attention uh, around the world especially after the 23-day the siege in 2017. Uh, at that time, his profile around the world increased dramatically and a lot of people were taking, uh, were, were um, giving a lot of attention to the work that he was doing. And it was, um, it was soon after that that uh, essentially he started to be recognized seriously by academics and started to be, uh, his, his ideas and his resistance started to become central to a lot of different campaigns and movements. Now, uh, there was a whole different range of ways that we were by bypassing the, um, the censorship there. Um, but I should mention that it was in 2016, after the uh, Supreme Court ruling in Papua New Guinea that um, stated that the detention center is illegal and unconstitutional, it was after that that um, the the um, immigration department, um, the, the system basically couldn't stop people having phones uh, in the prison. So from that point on, Behus didn't have to hide his phone anymore, but he began to be subject to a whole range of different kinds of um, uh, silencing strategies, different kinds of oppression, different kinds of suppression, So it, it, which included bullying tactics and, and, and other, other ways. Um, a forced movement, forced displacement within the within the island. So, so it's uh, there were a whole range of different obstacles that were placed um, in front of him. But we 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 managed to do it, and I think the book is just a testament to the human um, to, to the human will, to the to to resistance, to the desire to have freedom, to to be heard. Um, the last point I want to make is about the the philosophical dimension to this. Now. 
a lot of people ask, uh, why didn't the Australian government just step in and um, take his phone and, and stop him from doing everything, stop him from exposing this system? And in a very perverse way, Behruz's reporting, Behruz's activism, Behruz's writing became almost like a promotional tool for the oppressive um, uh, border politics in Australia in, for a system that is designed to deter people from coming there to that country and uh, seeking asylum, for a system that is actually um, whose sole purpose is to make things so horrible that people will uh, agree to, to uh, be deported or uh, never uh, attempt to uh, ask for um, protection again. In a system like that, Behruz's work actually supports the, the rhetoric of the government. Now, I think one of the reasons why they didn't censor him completely was one, because they wanted, they, they, they wanted people around the world to know how brutal they are, how, how difficult it is to, um, uh, or, or impossible it is to go to Australia and seek asylum. But at the same time, they realized that if they stop Behruz, they actually confirm uh, his critique about them being fascist, about them uh, applying fascist techniques to uh, to suppress people. So I think this, this dimension is really important as well. But after everything that Behrouz had done, after all the resistance, after um, finding ways to get the message across, I think what's important is that Behrouz created a crack in the system. And that crack um, was something that the system couldn't anticipate and had no strategy or no no reaction to. And you know, winning the awards, um, uh, being able to flee from the island and go to New Zealand, um, becoming a spokesperson for human rights, for uh, for uh, freedom of movement, for for justice for people whose lives have been ruined. That was something that the system didn't anticipate, couldn't, didn't have a response to, doesn't know how to react to. And in fact, the last point is that the politicians in Australia refused publicly to talk about Behruz in any serious way. Most of them never mention his name because they know once they do that, everyone will begin to see him as a human being, as um, someone who deserves uh, rights, deserves freedom, just like everyone else, someone who is creative, intelligent, someone who knows something about our society and our politics that maybe we don't. And to, to identify him in any way, to, um, uh, to um, discuss, to, to talk about him as a person, will go against everything that the government has been designing um, in terms of dehumanizing refugees. So Behruz's activism ultimately in the end uh, damaged the government in a way that they don't know how to respond to. And I think this should be used or leveraged to basically um, create new ways forward to dismantle the system and to ensure uh, the rights of all people um, subject to border politics. Thank you, Omid. That is incredibly fascinating and the different dimensions of it and the different ways the Australian government is trying to navigate and um, save their own image is really fascinating too. Um, I, I did want to ask a question. I think we had this question when we had our chat too. For so much, so much of the information that was being censored and being blocked from coming out and you managed to get it out eventually, um, there was the different tools that you use, the different tech tools that you use. And we are in a community where there are a lot of technologists, there are different activists and so on who are working within the tech center who may be listening or will listen to this afterwards. What would you say is needed from these um, either technologists or um, tech companies like Twitter, um, Facebook, WhatsApp, so on is needed in terms of um, them providing more support for those who are in similar situations right now to get these stories out. Um, we don't have enough time to get into this very deeply, but if you have some quick reflections. Should I answer? Yes. Yeah, okay. I think, uh, you know, the first part of what Omid said, actually, I'm not uh, agree. Uh, 
uh, that he said that uh, it, in some ways uh, they were quite happy that we could send a message or, you know, you know, that is a political thing that Australian government, political comment, they say that. So uh, we want to send a message to refugees in other countries that don't come to here. If you come here, we do this on you. You know, we are horrible people. I am not angry with that. Why? Because they exile us to a remote place that because they didn't want that people hear about us. They exile us there. They wanted to torture us there and send us back. And they didn't have a plan at the beginning, you know. After a while, they kept us there. They, uh, they create another strategy. So always they change their strategy. They never had the strategy about this. I believe in that. The, the thing is that they twice, so we didn't have access to internet. They always search our rooms, our tents, to take our uh, phones. And they took my phone twice, and I had to struggle to smuggle another phone in, you know? And they did all of this, and why, uh, why they didn't stop me, they did that. They uh, tried that and they took my phone twice. But I think the good thing that I did, I'm happy about it, is that for two years, I didn't publish work under my real name because I didn't feel safe with them. After two years, when I became sure that I have a network, I have a network of uh, journalists, you know, uh, human rights defenders, you know. On that time, I published, started to publish my work. So I didn't definitely, if they knew. And the interesting thing, they, uh, there was a document that linked to the media after six years that we did a story on Guardian, so with Guardian, and they uh, employed uh, the, the detective and send it to the prison camp to find out who is providing this information. It was important for them. And uh, so I mean that it was not easy. Yeah, we were, Always I say that the, there is a, this, the way Australian government is treating the refugees is a dictatorship. And even they had this law that anyone who talk, anyone from the staff, they, they have this law in Australia. They put them in jail for two years. And they deported many uh, journalists from Manus Island. Sometimes some journalists reach to that island. And I remember they put the picture of Ben Doherty from Guardian in their office and in uh, on the island that anyone who see this man, let us know, call this number. So I mean that there was a very, very dictatorship system there. And even they deported Omid. Do you remember? <laughs> you know, they oh, they deported Omid once. He, <laughs> yeah, he uh, actually reached to the island one day. Uh, I think after five years. Yeah, they deported him. Oh, I didn't know so, that. I mean, yeah, yeah, it was not. I mean that it was not easy. And uh, so, regarding the companies such as Twitter, actually, Twitter for me. Uh, I hate Twitter because <laughs> no, no, no. Because I am a, I am a, I know myself as an artist, and Twitter doesn't let me to have my own space. That's why I hate Twitter. I use it, but I love Twitter too because uh, Twitter is for me uh, is like uh, my media. 
So I really use Twitter a lot and Twitter really uh, was a, has been a great platform for me to uh, say what I want to say and challenge the system to share my works and Facebook too and WhatsApp. Yeah. I love WhatsApp because WhatsApp is like uh, my office. I made the movie there. I wrote a book there and I published, I wrote many articles there and I communicated to the world with the world through WhatsApp. Right. And I think, yeah. So, I mean, generally what, what I want from these companies uh, that I have a paradoxical feeling towards them, especially Twitter, I hate it and I love it, which is security. It's very important security because I really didn't feel safe when I was there. And now with the, so I'm not expert in this issue, but it is my only concern really. I was so concerned about my security and but I think, yeah. This is a really important point, and I think it speaks to a lot of people that may be watching, and we are running out of time. I'm sorry for anyone that may have had questions, but I think some of the um, massive points that we have and calls to actions that we have from both of you is that, one, we need to hold a lot of these companies and these private contracts accountable. We need to figure out who is continuing to sponsor them even within our own um, tech and human rights communities that um, we are aware of that these contracts continue to happen to provide more of a voice to people who are in similar situations and continue to understand the impact beyond um, the camps themselves but the colonial impact on the indigenous communities on these different um, islands in different places and finally, we need more security. And I and I know this is not a area for you and Amit, but the people that are listening are many of the experts that would be working on some of this stuff. And um, but I want to thank you both incredibly. Yeah, thank you. I'm really sorry. I should mention just one sentence. Sure. It's uh, which is about the trolls. So. Uh -huh. but online violence actually i have been under attack by the trolls for many years and still i am facing this okay. and so, yeah so i i never blocked them but it's uh, really difficult sometimes they yeah they are really and i mostly am um, really worry about uh, people who follow me mm. for example because they they find it very brutal and many of them always say that oh we cannot continue like this. but i mostly i you know my uh, i don't read the comments that's why i don't care about them but really uh yeah it's it is a big problem uh, i think it is a global problem but for me i really i have been under uh, attack by these trolls thank you barrows and that's a really important you. topic that i think they talk about often and i hope they will take your point very seriously about the trolls and the attacks on journalists thank you both we're about to go offline thank you omid and thank you barrows for being here um and uh, i we hope to hear from you more and more now that you're in new zealand Take care. Bye. Thanks, Afsana. Thanks, Petrus.